Okay, that's that. <laughs> okay. So the arrows are f forward and back. New toy, guys. New toy. <laughs> We're uh, tech set. <laughs> Book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. And it goes like this. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon, Shelon, Ephrathites. If I pronounce that wrong, you try it. <laughs> of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Shelon also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said to her, Surely she will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. They will. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should say I have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Verse 16. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever, when, wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened. When they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went, out, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of of barley harvest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you, Lord God, just that we can open up the scriptures openly and not in private. We thank you that we can worship together, Lord God. And we ask you just in this moment, Lord God, I know we're all going to go and be with family and friends and, 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 and have fun today. But before we do that, Lord God, let us reflect. Let us see your word for what it is. So you can change us for who we are. And Father, we ask you that your word penetrate every heart. Loosen every mind. Open every heart. Open every spirit to receive what the spirit is saying to the church this morning. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, just on a place of order really quick. Uh, I wanted to do this before and I, I completely forgot. But I, I want to say a quick prayer for a couple things. Um... I, I, I love sports. I don't know how many of you love sports. I love sports. I'm, I'm a sports geek. Um, Star Wars geek. 
<laughs> all that stuff. That's me. But uh, this weekend, I was I was reading an article where how many of you guys ever heard of Johnny Manziel? Johnny Manziel, young football player, comes out. His family's very wealthy, very rich. Family is oil oil money in Texas, millionaires. Uh, played college ball, did really good, got drafted by the Cleveland Browns, came, played. Uh, he's been in the NFL for two years. And his father put out a request, um, I think it was Friday or Saturday. And I was, I was sharing this with my mother because it really it gripped me and I found myself just praying for him. Uh, his father put out a request that said, we have no contact with him. We can't reach him. If anybody can please reach him. I'm afraid my son is not going to make it to his 24th birthday. And for, for you know, we, we look at some of these athletes, and, and for some odd reason, we put them in this pedestal as if they have this, this type of character that sometimes they just don't. And then we bash them through the media when, when, when they fall short of our expectations. But I just found that that, that hit me because as a dad, this, is, this guy's... I, probably, I think he's a billionaire. But for a billionaire to put that in the public eye and say, somebody, please help me save my son. How desperate is this father for his son? And, and, and it just, it hit me. I wept over it. I cried over it. I, 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 I literally, I was praying for this kid. He's 23 years old. And I've got a 14-year-old, going to be 15, not too far off few years short of that, but my kids are growing. And I know if, if I was hurting like that, I would want somebody to pray for my kid. <laughs> On top of that, I think we should pray for the event that is happening today, not for the team <clears throat> of who's going to win or lose. But guys, there's tragedy all over the world. And we, they, we have a spiritual enemy. And he wants to kill, steal, and destroy and unfortunately, there are some people that give ear to that, that would love to see chaos and murder and death. And I think we should pray because we're, we're in the church. It's not about, well, they're not saved. They get what they deserve. They're, they, you know, they're, no, 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 no. No, we all deserve hell. That's the truth. That's right. You know, for the person that says, well, I don't. I'm going to step back because lightning is about to hit you. <laughs> because the reality is we all deserve punishment. Right. We all deserve, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life. Amen. And so I think, I want to pray again. I want to pray for Johnny Menzel, his family, that, that, that God reach him. That God send the message of the cross to send the message of hope and peace to that family. And also just to the crowds of, that are there for the Super Bowl. That the hand of God protect these people. Protect this event. Not because it's just the event, but because if that something catastrophic would happen, do we fully understand what that would mean to you and I? And so I, I just want to, let's just pray really quick again. Can we do that? And then we're going to get right into the word. Yeah, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we, we lift up Johnny Manziel, Lord God, where I don't know where he's at. Father, the rumors are at that he's, he's on drugs and he's running away from everybody. Wherever he's at, whatever hotel room, wherever he is, he is at in his car, Father, I pray the Holy Spirit minister to him right now. Lord God, that that depression, that spirit of depression, and, and, and Lord God, that, that there's no thoughts, Father, uh, of harming himself. And we rebuke the voice of the enemy, Lord God, in that vehicle or in that place where this young man is at. And Father, we ask you that the gospel message reach him right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray, Lord God, for the people that are there at the Super Bowl. We pray for the state of California, our government. We pray for our nation, Lord God. We pray for the people. We pray for this world. But right now, Lord God, we pray that your hand be on that event, Lord God, to protect the people. Lord God, spoil, Lord God, the plans of the enemy. And Father, we ask you that your peace and your provision be there. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, we are, in, we are starting the book of Ruth. We read the entire chapter, first chapter here. And the book of Ruth, I'm going to introduce some characters here. But I want to say this just to start off. And mark this down as a footnote. 
uh, as you study this, as we go into the study of, of the book of Ruth, the main, there's, there's, there's different characters, but the main theme, the main thought through the book of Ruth is one word, providence. God's providence. Webster's Dictionary defines God's providence as divine guidance or care. It is uh, God conceived as the power sustaining and guiding human destiny. That's what providence means. Providence means is the divine guidance and care of God. Because as believers and as Christians, you know, we, so many times, if you've been in this long enough, you know, for those of you that had the opportunity to see a miracle, so many times we, we want to see the hand of God move in a healing. We want to see the hand of God move in, in this miraculous way. And we have stories of the Red Sea parting. And we have stories of Elijah praying and fire coming down from heaven. And we have all these beautiful stories of the gospel and Jesus raising the dead, healing the uh, the blind and the lame and the sick and casting out demons and these miraculous miracles. And for those of you that ever have, have been a part of that or healed uh, by through a miracle, thank God for that. But most don't. Most people that get cancer don't get healed. Most people that are going through financial struggles don't get $10,000 checks in the mail. Those of you that have old cars, Oprah doesn't give them a new one. <laughs> it's the truth. You got to go to work like I got to go to work. You got to sweat like I got to sweat. We got to toil in this life for the little that we have. And most of the time we're, we're waiting and we're looking for God to give us provision in a way that we want no part of the work. Mm. Let me say that again. Amen. We want God to provide for you and I yeah. in a way so that he does all the work and I can sleep in. Right, right. <laughs> Honey, don't work that way. Amen. I challenge you to go write a check to PG&E and say, I have no money in the account, but I fully intend to pay you one day because I have been praying for God to send me a check or win the lottery. And when one of those two things happen, PG&E, I give, I cross my heart and hope to die, I will, you can cash that check. Go to the grocery store and do that. Go to the doctor's office and do that. Go to the insurance company and do that. That ain't going to happen. Because most of the time, God doesn't work that way. That's right. He works through provision. Provision takes time. Provision builds character. Mm -hmm. Provision tells the story of who you really are. See, that's why provision is important. Because we want miracles. And God's saying, didn't I give you the world? Didn't I bring you into this earth? Are you not still breathing? Am I not still sitting on the throne? But that's not good enough. I want the lottery. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient. Amen. Right. Wow. My grace is sufficient. So those of us that don't have the silver spoon, this book is for you. This book, is, this book is for the one who lost a husband or lost a wife through death. This book is for you. For those of you that have gone into relationships and made a bad decision in who you chose, you don't got to say nothing because I know you don't want to because that other person is looking at you and sitting right <laughs> next to you. I get it. I get it. I am extremely happy that I am married to my wife. I cannot speak for her on the other side. I would hope, I would pray. My God. But for those of us that have made bad decisions, whether relationship, family, 
kids early, sick children, whatever the case is, this book is for you. Yes. Amen. The story of Ruth is in a time frame of the book of Judges. If you've ever read the, the book of Judges, the book of Judges begins by saying a very, very, very famous statement right after the book of Joshua, after they got the Ten Commandments, and after they're going through all of this stuff. The book of Judges begins by saying one simple statement. Men lived as they wanted to, and they did as they chose. That was the book of Joshua, or the book of Judges. <coughs> There was no kings at the time. King Saul has not come into play. King David has not come into play as of yet. And in the book of Judges, it is ruling of itself. There's no government. God sends a prophet to judge the people. And then, and then they'll, they'll straighten up. And then they'll backslide. And then they'll straighten up. And then they'll backslide. The book of Ruth is placed right around the time of Judges chapter 6. Roughly. The book of Ruth is placed at a time of complete chaotic turmoil because there was no ruler to rule. People did as they chose. And in that, there was a, na a city that was very close where the story begins in the city of Bethlehem. <coughs> and here's a couple things to think about here as it introduces this chapter. Chapter 1, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, that's what it's talking about in the book of Judges, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to say this, this part of the, of the story of where it's talking about a Bethlehem, Bethlehem will be a very famous city that we will find out much, much later in the book of Luke, because who was born in Bethlehem? Jesus. Okay, thank you. Making sure. <laughs> Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem, the city of David. And he was born there in, in, with absolutely nothing. So the story begins in the city of Bethlehem where there was a famine. Let me give you some backdrop here. A famine in the Old Testament usually symbolizes the judgment of God. The judgment on a nation. The judgment on a city. The judgment of, of God because these people could no longer provide. Because who gives rain? God. Who raises the crops? God. Who keeps the cattle healthy or not sick? God. So who gives provision? God. Amen. So it's laying down the foundation that during a time of absolute chaos and turmoil, God is judging what? The city of Bethlehem. How do we know that? Because we find out in this same chapter that together his wife and his two sons went to live in a country called Moab. Moab was a city 50 miles away from Bethlehem. Why is that important? Let me ask you a question. If we're having a drought in Tracy, if we're having a drought in Modesto, if we're having a drought in Manteca, is it not also a drought in Sacramento? Or in San Francisco? Because it's 50 miles away. Roughly. So if you're in Modesto, and we're having this severe famine and drought, wouldn't you think they'd be going through the same thing in Merced? Yeah. Right. Common sense. What? Same climate. Same area. Same territory. But for some reason, there was a drought and a famine in Bethlehem. <coughs> But there was not one in the city called Moab. Moab was 50 miles away. Moab and the history of Moab comes from the lineage of Lot. The Bible says that when Lot left the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and he went with his two daughters because his wife became a pillar of salt, their husbands had died, they didn't bear children. What did they do if you remember the story? They got Lot drunk. His daughters got Lot drunk, had incest. They laid with their father, and they had children. And the oldest bore a son, who became Moab, the Moabites. It came through incest. These people became known and grown because of incest. So that's the history of the city of Moab. Moab was a city that later we will find Solomon judging them. 
later on. And at God telling them, destroy them. Destroy them. And we'll find later on, if you read your Bible in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings and Balaam and all these different stories of Moab and the Moabites and, and, and armies and fighting and all of that stuff that will come to play. But this book is written, and let me say this too, we don't know who wrote the book of Ruth. Not sure. A lot of times we'll know because it'll say written by Paul, written by so and so. Many people have assumed that it was the prophet Samuel. But when we get to the end of the book of Ruth, it tells the genealogy and the book ends by saying King David. So what does that say to us? That says this. The book of Ruth was written several generations later. And it was whoever wrote the book wrote it as a reflection of history. So they're looking at it through the perspective of, I'm a, I got to share this quick story with you of a woman named Ruth. There's no miracles. There's no healings. There's no, there's no, no, no miraculous events that happen in the book of Ruth. It is only and clearly providence. God leading them. So the Moabites were there. They were, they were through incest. They were lost. And they served strange gods. Ashtoreth, which is basically the god of fertility, sexuality, and war. Shemoth, which was the destroyer of the fish god as well. And in 1 Kings 11 and 7, Solomon declares that they are an abomination. Moab. Why? Because of their idolatry and their wicked ways. So to an Israelite, to a Jew... The Moabites were just not very good people. So here's the scenario. The book of Ruth begins with no ruling, no king, none of that. God's judgment on the city of Bethlehem. And we find a story of a family that is about to leave the blessed city of Bethlehem that is under God's judgment to a city of Moab that is completely twisted. Completely pagan, completely non-Christian, completely opposite of where they were from. Verse 2, it says, and the man's name was Elimelech. And it's funny because this is the father's name. This is the first character we are introduced. Elimelech's name means my God, a king. That's what his name means. But Elimelech, what did Elimelech do? He moved his family to the city of Moab. Why is that important? Because the city of Moab represents what? Something opposite. You see, as fathers, you and I, we're, we're dads. Those of you that are young men that don't have families, you will one day, hopefully by the blessing of God, be a father and have children. Understand this. As the Bible calls you the head of the house, that doesn't mean that you are more important than your wife, but that does mean that the responsibility does lie on you. That's the way it works. That's the way it is. You have an issue, talk to the senior pastor. I got his number. It's called prayer. Talk to him. Let's call him and ask him. I didn't make that up. I didn't put that rule in because if it was me, I would have reversed it <laughs> completely. I would have blamed Eve, not Adam. That's just my biased opinion. But this man, through turmoil, through a situation of logic that said, financially, it's too hard here. We're going to pick up and move. Understand this, that where, where you guide your family to is the environment in which they will live. So as you guide your family, men, it is the environment in which your family will reside. And the enemies that are, that are surrounding you, it is because of the location you have chose. The people that have fellowship with your wife, it is because of the location you have chose. The people, the, the, the women that will marry your sons will be because of the location that you chose. And the men that will come knocking on the door for your daughter will be because of the location that you chose. So I want to ask you before we move any further, Elimelech, for a man, for his name to mean my God is king. Where do we find in this that he prayed for God's wisdom 
and provision. You see, sometimes we go through logic. We go through our own thoughts and we figure this stuff out ourselves because angel says plan. If plan A works, then plan. Then we go to plan B and then step C and step D. I got it all planned out. This is all going to work out exactly like I thought. And then what usually happens? <coughs> it don't work like that. At least for me, never does it work like that. I don't care how well I plan it out. You know, usually this is what we do, okay? God, I just bought this house. I just bought this car, and I just got this brand new job. Bless it. <laughs> Father, help us to pay the mortgage. Help us to pay this. Help us to pay that and everything else. And God, thank you because I know you're going to come through. And then God was going, wait, what time on the time on time? What house are you talking about? Because this is the first time you're talking to me about it. What are you talking about? What car are you talking about? Because this is the first time you've come to me about it. What are you talking about? What, what, how can I bless what I do not know you have? You see, because logically we say, here it is. And God says, but you don't understand where I'm leading you. What is provision? Provision is God's guidance and providing because so many times, and guys, this is human nature. This is, this is the reality. The strong, the hardest, difficult thing in a church body is to be is for the the leadership because it starts with us first. But for all of us, members, leaders, pastors, for us just to be real. I, I you know, I was driving here and I was thinking about this. I'll give you a perfect example. I have a Sukkot on. <clears throat> all right. Don't judge me for what I'm about to tell you right now. All right? Don't judge me. Don't judge me. All right? I was running late. Okay? I ironed the front part of my shirt. I didn't iron the back part of my shirt. Because, well, I wasn't planning on taking off my coat. Don't judge me for that. All right? But in the spiritual sense, we do that all the time. What's going to show? And what's not? So let me take care of what's going to show. Because I can hide what's not. You see, we, we can put Christianese vocabulary around anything. Amen. Anything. Amen. But that don't mean it's Christian. It. And that don't mean it's Christ. But we can call it what we want. But what does God call it? So we have a Lemelech in this situation that he finds himself... That he makes a decision to relocate his family in a place that we know and understand that the Bible has spoken negatively about. So my question to you is this, man. Where are you moving towards? And what is the environment you are about to expose your family to? This man was named Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. Naomi meant pleasant, which is a complete... Polar opposite when we read the story of what Naomi was. Naomi wasn't pleasant. The chick was bitter. And she said it herself. So we find my king of God making logical decisions without prayer. We find Naomi was to be pleasant. And that she was everything but. And then she had the names of her two sons, which was Malon and Kelon. Malon means literally sickness. Shelon meant literally dying. It would be the equivalent of me calling my boys, and you know, I have two boys. And I said, um, hey, Zars and Cancer, come here. <laughs> Come here, cancer. Here. I love this cancer. It's good cancer. It's growing up. Strong. Been strong cancer. That'd be the equivalent. Who would who in the world would name their kid Lupus? Who? Because if you are, we I don't know if we need to pray for you, slap you in the back of the head. But Who's going to name your kid Lupus? They named Elimelech, who does not ex 
exemplify my God being a king. Naomi is anything but pleasant. Name their children dying and fading. Hey, dying, hey, fading, come here. It is possible, though, historically, that people would name their children based on what they felt they, their outcome was going to be. It is possible that these, these boys were born sick. They were ill. It is possible that these boys had sicknesses and they were born with it. So why in the world, as a responsible father, would you relocate your family and take them on a journey that we are going to find out kills them? Because men, you leave. Where you leave, your family will follow. The spiritual environment you leave, your family will follow. The Bible reading you lead in men, your family will follow. The prayer life you lead in men, your family will follow. And either your kids are going to be healthy or they're going to be sick. <clears throat> but it's your choice. It keeps on, it goes on, and it says, and they were uh, Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. They were Jews. And they went to Moab and they lived there. They resided there, they stayed there, and they grew. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Here's the thing, dude. Seriously, why did they move? Anybody have any idea? Because of the famine? To live. <laughs> and he dies. Why is that important? It's important for this reason, guys. You and I have no, we cannot dictate what happens. On your wedding day, whether you're on your first marriage, second marriage, third marriage, fourth marriage, fifth, I don't know, whatever number you are at, when you got married, I'm sure you believed with all of your heart, both of you, this is for life. I'm marrying this person because I love her. Man, she's hot. He's good looking. You know, and... and all this stuff. And the plan, you had it all planned out. Some of you girls planned out your wedding since you were 10. <coughs> had it all planned out. And then you find out 10 years into the marriage, he's a jerk. <laughs> you find out 10 years into the marriage, dude, it's not that, it's not that she didn't know how to cook, she didn't want to cook. <laughs> and... You know, you find out he smells, you find out, you, you know, your drains in the shower get clogged by hair. You find out all those stuff. Where are you at now? Because sometimes life just takes you into places and in areas that you didn't anticipate to go. <clears throat> you didn't think it was going to get there. You didn't think your marriage was going to get there. You know, whenever we're talking to couples and they're dealing with issues in their marriage and whether it's uh, 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 faithfulness or whatever the case is, I said, you know, and, and, and they want to talk about what the other person, they want to talk about the person that came into the marriage from the outside and, and all this stuff. And I always stop, 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 stop. We don't want to talk about them. We want to talk about you. Why? Because my question is not how did he or she come into the picture. My question is, how did you get to the edge of your life at a point in your marriage to jump off that cliff onto a different mountain? Because if we can't find the answer of why you walked away and got close to the cliff and a little bit of wind pushed you off, it doesn't matter about the other person. Because that other person is just going to become another person and another person and another person and another yeah. person. So the question is, where, how did your heart drift so far? And where are you at with God? Because sometimes life just takes you in a place that you didn't anticipate you would end up at. So he dies. The husband died. And she was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women. They married women that were local there. One named Orpah. Not Oprah. Orpah. <laughs> Actually, it's a funny story. Actually, did you know that o Oprah's name was supposed to be Orpah? 
Don't ask me how I know that because I am not answering that right now. <laughs> I'm going to say my wife told me and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But the name Orpa means stiff neck. So we are introduced to different characters. One, my king of God. One is pleasant. One is sickness. One is dying. And one is stiff-necked. That's your Thanksgiving dinner family. <laughs> and then the last name we are introduced is a woman named Ruth. There is some debate over the meaning of the name. The name Ruth Many of them would, the more common belief of the name Ruth means a fellow woman. Just an average woman. Fellow man. Just, hey, average. You are so average. That's what her name was. Some say companion. But the majority believe that her name means fellow woman. Just a fellow woman. Just the average woman. Just somebody that just kind of comes on the scene. Notice she is the last person introduced. All of these crazy names are right before her. And then it says, oh, and the other Ruth. The other, that other one. She needs to go shower. She needs to comb her hair. Brush her hair or something. She's just the other one. It says, that, and they had lived there about 10 years in Moab. Let me ask you a question. Uh, if there was a if there was a famine in Bethlehem, ten years it took to change fifty miles away. They stayed there. Both Malon and Kilon also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard that Moab, that the Lord had come to aid His people by providing food for them, understand this: there's going to be two times that they talk about God two different ways. Two different ways that they speak about God in the book of Ruth. One is the writer speaking of God's provision through food and sustenance. The second way you're going to hear about God speak, speaking about is the people speaking. And you're going to find that Naomi is very negative. Very bitter. Very negative. Her perspective of everything is, is skewed a little bit. But these are the two perspectives you're going to hear about God. And I would venture to say that those are the two perspectives that we find in every person in the church. You're either going to find God as a provider or you're going to be bitter because you're in the process of. But you've got to find yourself in that place. <clears throat> Naomi and her daughter-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So they're heading back. They hear this food. They hear this provision. They're going back. Verse 8, then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown kindness, as you have shown to, to your dead and to me. You know what? I forgot, what we're here. I forgot these verses behind me. Am I too tall? Do I block it all? <laughs> So they're looking at going back now to Judah. They're looking going back to Bethlehem. They're tired of where they are at. They've lost everything. Mo, uh, Naomi at this point lost everything. Lost her house. You ever went through foreclosure? Lost her home. Lost her cars. Went through repo. Lost everything she had. Lost the dude that she dated in high school, lost them, lost her kids, and she's left with her daughter-in-laws that have no children. And in, in Hebrew culture, that's a big deal. Because women, uh, let, let me say this too, because a lot of the times you get from movies and history where people say that Christianity is derogatory towards women. That is a crock and a lie. That is an absolute lie. That, that people will say, oh, the Bible is, is, is derogatory towards women. It says that, you know, that men are the head of house. And it's a, dudes, pump the brakes. Pump the brakes a little bit. 
Because for the Bible to be in a masculine world and write an entire book about a woman, it's huge. It's huge. The story of Ruth is huge. The story of Esther is huge. So the people that say, well, the Bible's negative about women, that is a lie. Let me ask you a question. Who was the first one to see Jesus that reported his resurrection? Mary. 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 If you were going to if you were going to say a story as a Jewish person, you were not going to start with a woman. <clears throat> That's the truth. I'm not I'm not speaking derogatory towards women. Don't, don't jump me when I'm done here. <laughs> but that's the real that's the mentality of it. And yet the Bible depicts a woman being the first voice eye witness of the resurrection. So don't let that stuff get in your head. That's a lie. The Bible liberates women more than any other book in history. <coughs> and it is kinder as well. Anyways, that was my little rant. <laughs> Verse 9. May the Lord grant that each of you will, will rest in the home of another husband. So she's telling them, go. Go find another dude. <clears throat> so she kissed them and they lifted their voice and they wept. Thank you. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb? Look, you're about to catch a bitterness right now. That they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should say I have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? My daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. <coughs> Why is that important? Because that's where some of you are at right now. Some of you are thinking God's hand is against me. Look, I struggle financially. God's hand is against me. I've gone through struggles in my marriage. God's hand is against me. My kids are sick. God's hand is against me. My home, my home was taken. My car was taken. My business was closed. I've gone through struggles. I've gone through turmoil. I've gone to church. I've gone to prayer meetings. I sing in the choir. I've done leadership. I've done ministry. I evangelize. I pray. I fast. But somehow, someway, somewhere, God is against me. Why? Because your house, because your car... Because the people around you. Let me say this to the Naomi's that are here. <coughs> Unfortunately, some of you have just been led astray because of your Elimelech in your life. Some of you have been put in difficult positions to live through. And they have walked out. Some of you have been left to be alone. Some of you have been left emotionally. Some of you have been left physically. And Elimelech is out of the picture. And now, whoa, and now Naomi. Did I press something? No. Okay. Well, let's just go on. And Elimelech has left the scene. And Naomi is still there. And some of you, and I'll say this to the women, because predominantly that's who it pertains to. Some of you women have been left in shambles because of the man that had left you behind. And they left you in Moab. They left you with no fruit. They left you with no home. They left you with no destiny. They left you with no story. And they left you ashamed. And you say, God's against me. No, he's not. No, he's not. Because through this book, we're going to find that... I, I was sharing this with... I don't remember who in the church I was sharing this with. How many of you ever read the story of Joshua when he's fighting... And he asked the sun to stand still, moon stay in your place. And I was sharing that that story encourages me so much. Because every time I find myself in a difficult place, or, or, or better yet, this is more than likely, I have led myself or my family into a difficult place. 
that the story of Joshua praying that prayer encourages me, and this is why. Those of you that are science majors, we're all in science class. Does the earth rotate around the sun, or does the sun rotate around the earth? The earth rotates around the sun. The earth rotates around the sun. But yet Joshua said, sun, stand still. Moon, stay in your place. And what did God do when Joshua prayed that prayer? The sun stood out, they were able to fight longer, and they won the victory. Why is that important? Because his science was wrong. Joshua asked for the wrong thing. He should have said, earth, stand still. Moon, stay in your place. But instead, he said, sun, stand still. And you know what God did? God said, I'll let you go with your ignorance because you didn't pass science class. <laughs> but I know your heart. Because I know your heart. I know you didn't mean to get there. You stumbled by getting there. But I got you. I got you with the dad you were born with. I got you with the family you were born in. I got you in the relationship you found yourself in. Now you're a Christian. Now you're going, what did I do when I was 19? Why did I go to prison? How come I can't find a job? How come my kids are distant? How come I have no relationship? Because God is saying through it all, I know your heart. I got you. I got you. I know he, there was, God didn't put you in drug addiction. You got yourself there. That's right. That's right. God didn't put you in the prison. You got yourself there. That's right. That's right. Did God know the whole time you were getting yourself there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll be there sitting there with you. See, here's the difference. Some of you have forgotten the moments that God sat with you in prison. Amen. See, because God's different than your friends. Because your friends are going, we're going to break you out. <laughs> So what? You can run? You see, here's the difference. God's not raising up cowards. Amen. That's right. God's not raising up weak soldiers. God wants to know what you're made of. And if you're going to stick there and serve me, then I'm going to sit here with you. I'm not just going to come visit you at times. But I'm going to sit there with you. Because what did Jesus say at the end of Matthew? When you have... Where, didn't you go heal the sick? Didn't you go take feed the homeless? Didn't you go visit the person in prison? Yes, Lord, we did all of that because when you did it to them, you what? You did it to me. So what does that mean, ex-con? That he was sitting right there with you. Amen. He wasn't waiting for you to be released. He was sitting with you when you were stupid and in your mess. Amen. Amen. That's what that means. And God knew that when the homies weren't around that you would say, I don't want to be this person anymore. And that's how you got here. Amen. You think you, you know, the statement of, oh, I found God. You didn't find nobody. <laughs> you can't find your wallet and your keys or your shoes. And some of you, your dentures. You can't find them yourself. You didn't find God. God went chasing you. Amen. So here's a woman finding herself in a place and she's bitter. God is against me. No. 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 Verse 14. And this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother in law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. But Naomi said, Look, look said Naomi. Your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. gods. Yeah. See, here's the difference. Here's the difference between the stiff-necked and the average woman. Because that's what the names are. Stiff-necked and average. You see, the stiff neck said, oh, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to be there with you. I ain't leaving you to the end. Oh, I can go? <laughs> This is my church. This is, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Oh, but, but, but that guy is looking at me and he's kind of cute. I know he ain't saved, but I think I can get him saved. 
I'll let you feel read between the lines on that one. Because it's so common. It's so common that, that, that we do that. That we speak as we're in and our heart is not there. She wasn't stiff-necked because she was rude to Naomi. She was stiff-necked because she was rude to God. She rejected God. She walked away from God. She had an opportunity to go to the people of God and she said, I'm good. I just like going to a house group at home. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to be a part of a body. I don't want to be a part of their mess. I want to get involved with their stuff. They don't even know me. So stick nap left and common women stay. Thank God for common women. Verse 16, it says, But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I go. And where you stay, I stay. Your people will be my people.